Hey, welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Bukolsky. As always, I do my best to scour this world to find people to bring you value so you can ultimately understand what goes into building the body you love, looking, feeling, performing at your best at any age, but especially for men over 35, because ultimately, gents, I relate. I know what you're going through. Life can be hard. Getting to the gym can be hard. Doing it effectively is even harder. And I'm not just here to inspire you to go to the gym. I'm not here to be your cheerleader. I'm here to teach you how to make the most of what you do when you get there. Effectiveness and efficiency is ultimately where I cut my teeth, where I make my money, and ultimately where I find my passion. Today's guests are two incredible, incredible coaches from uh, as high as the Olympic level and certainly in the university level. Uh, Eric Corum and Dr. Chris Morris join me today, both of which are incredible performance experts in their space. We're going to talk about the science of adaptive capacity. Dr. Eric Quorum has spent 15 years coaching in the NFL and collegiate levels of sports as a sports scientist and performance director. He's actually also coached a number of Olympic gold medal winning athletes. He's an expert in developing physical optimization plans and determining the best way to stay fit at any level. And we have an incredible conversation around pushing the barriers of high performance and what he does and how he looks at it. Dr. Carol Quorum has also founded a company called AIM7, which he founded in 2020. AIM7 supports users' individual goals by creating personalized guidance, ultimately using your wellness data, uh, amplified machine learning, and grounded in science of behavior change, and just incredible, incredible resource. Uh, Dr. Morris joins me today. He's a director of sports performance at the University of Kentucky. He is responsible for developing and implementing the best practices and strategies on reducing injuries, enhancing readiness. Readiness. Gentlemen, do you ever realize or ever notice, regardless of the sport you're in or the business you're in or the area of life you're in, if you're an expert at what you do, don't you notice that experts always seem to be talking about the same thing? Sometimes there's a little bit of divergence, but people who are truly at the top, certainly in health and fitness and performance, always come back to the same topics. We're coming back to adaptive capacity. We're coming back to the ability to adapt, adaptive capacity in its most literal form. How much capacity do you have to adapt? So many people out there are mindlessly going to the gym and slinging weights, or they're mindlessly following some non-existent plan and hoping, crossing the fingers, hoping to goodness that they can ultimately make progress. Gents, not going to happen. You got to make sure that you're doing the right things for your body and your body has the ability to adapt. I know this sounds like a lot to you, to many people it does because this is not where you're an expert. This is not where you cut your teeth. You need to make sure that ultimately you're doing the things your body needs to thrive. We, in this podcast, we talk about the concept of adaptive capacity and why stress can't be managed, but what you can do instead. The concept of fluid periodization and training to ultimately reach your fitness and performance goals the most important practices when it comes to mental fitness. We have a deep dive into sleep hygiene because ultimately sleep is probably your biggest lever when it comes to recovery. Uh, and a surprising few levers when it comes to sleep, the most important metrics to be watching for if high performance is your goal and so much more. Gents, if you're someone who wants to get the most out of your life, if you're someone who wants to get the most out of every minute of your day, whether that be with your business, with your family, or to moving toward your purpose and your passion, your body and your mind have to be there to support you. When you ultimately ask your body and mind to do something and you don't have that fifth gear that you're looking for, you're limiting your abilities. Your decisions are limited or your decisions are ultimately influenced by your inabilities. Rather than decisions being based on what you want to do and what you need to do in that moment, your decisions are being influenced by what you can't do. And to me, that's pain. If I get up in the morning and I say, I want to go do something and I want to do something hard and I want to push my body and my mind or even I want to get up and have enough energy to go to work. I have enough energy to come home and play with my kids and I don't. That's pain. I hate that idea. And today we get into some of the most important levers you should be pulling considering when ultimately you're thinking about improving your ability to adapt. Today's podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Paleo Valley. Just before I jump into the podcast, uh, I actually had a little snack. I went into some grass-fed meat sticks, uh, which are just phenomenal. They have many different flavors. They have... Um, uh, one of my favorite ones is summer sausage. They have a spicy and non-spicy and just all grass-fed, high-quality, convenient snacks. One of the challenges that many of us have as busy entrepreneurs, executives, anyone in this modern life, truly just uh, you know finding snacks 
that can hold us over when it's not maybe mealtime or maybe we're in a rush to get some protein and we're not sure how we're going to end our daily protein intake. One of my favorite ways to do so, and with my kids as well, is just using a couple of grass-fed meat sticks to get uh, all of our daily protein intake from a high quality source you can trust, 100% grass-fed and grass-finished and um, just love the flavors as well. You can, and then so many other great products as well that I haven't mentioned. They've got a bone broth protein, which is phenomenal. They've got protein bars, which I love and my kids love. And these guys are huge on supporting um, environmental restoration and animal welfare as well, which are obviously big hot topics right now in our world. Um, so ladies and gents, head over to paleovalley.com slash muscle to get hooked up with 15% off your first order. And again, 15 percent off our food is really significant because the margins on food products is very very small right some companies have large margins they work on some of them are small and we know that anything that's a food product as you can imagine in the grocery store the margins are incredibly small and so we really appreciate paleo valley uh, supporting this podcast and supporting you in your ability to ultimately um, get the best quality products put the best quality products into your body Gentlemen, welcome. And Eric, you started talking just before I paused you, and I was like, "Hold on a second here, let me record." Because that <laughs> this, this concept of adaptive capacity absolutely something I'm fascinated with, and I think it's not something you hear talked about often. And so uh, I'd love to just let you continue talking, and then I'll come back and have you guys talk about your past a little bit after you kind of riff on that. Yeah, I appreciate it. First of all, Chris and I are thrilled to be here today, and Chris, hop in anytime you want, but. Yeah, you know, stress gets a bad rap. Mm. You know, everybody's like, oh, I'm, you know, we need to manage stress. We need to manage stress. Well, first of all, you can't manage stress. That's a complete fallacy. You can't manage that you drive out into the intersection and somebody hits you, or you can't manage, you know, if you put out a podcast that people may react negatively. Those are things you just can't manage. What you can do is build the capacity to adapt to more stress with less cost. So that when you encounter the stress of life, it's not debilitating because stress is actually the gateway to growth. You know this, if you want to increase muscle hypertrophy or get stronger, what do you have to do? Deliberately engage with stress. If you want to learn a new skill, the only way to change your brain is to, you know, challenge yourself with maybe a new text or something that you want to learn that creates plastic changes in the brain. The problem is, is when acute stress or chronic stress exceeds your capacity to adapt to it. That is when you get injured. That is when you have poor physical and mental health outcomes. And so what Chris and I are on a mission to do, and we started this with elite athletes, college and pro athletes, and now we're bringing to the general population is like, how do you build this capacity? So you have, as Chris likes to talk about, like having a bigger gas tank. So I'll, I'll pass that baton to you, Chris, because he has a lovely way of describing this. The way I kind of got onto this was back when I started my my dissertation and my research and I came across a technology called Omega Wave. Omega Wave measures heart rate variability. And we had two athletes come in at the time. One of them was uh, Bud Dupree, who is probably one of the most genetically gifted athletes I've ever been around. And then another one was a long snapper that probably wasn't one of our most genetically gifted athletes. And it didn't matter what Bud did he would come in and test green every single day and uh him and this athlete came in bud tested green this athlete tested red and the athlete was like well you know what this technology is terrible you know him and i were out drinking till three o'clock in the morning and he tests green and i test red what's going on so like at that point i was like got the question in my head i was like why do some people can do these things and come in here and recover at much faster rates than other people And so that was that first inclination of like some people genetically are born with very large genetic gas tanks. So they can go out and stress their bodies to the 10th degree versus other people uh, genetically have smaller gas tanks. So that was the initiation of like the idea of the gas tank concept. And that kind of kickstarted my questions like, well, how can anybody increase their gas tank no matter where they start genetically? And you start kind of digging into all those factors and what you find is, you know, people have a ton of limiting factors. And as we age, like mental stress, how well do you handle mental stress or how well do you respond to mental stress? How well does that, or how much does that deplete your gas tank? You know, how physically fit are you? How big is your gas tank already? So 
these are kind of the things that I started kind of researching and, and started to realize is like, well, we can actually stress our bodies to increase the size of our gas tanks and have better adaptive responses. And this kind of spurred into the fluid periodization concepts. So basically we just took a very small part of that. And, and when we assessed athletes on any given day, looking at heart rate variability, we could tell how much fuel was in that gas tank on that day. And then we adjusted their training volume to match that. And what we found was when you did that, athletes that followed this fluid model did less and adapted more. So, so it, one it's, second there, Chris. So, so what what is it? What does a gas tank? What does a fuel tank mean in this case? Are you referring to uh, a, a number of obviously adaptive processes, specifically muscle glycogen? You know, could could you kind of break that down and and define what goes into that? So basically, when we talk about stress, all stress initiates the same pathways, right? So it, it goes from central nervous system activation uh, down to these stress hormones, which are like cortisol, epinephrine, and they start activating these substreams, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's a mental stress. So if you've got finals or if you've got work-related issues, that's going to trigger that same response as if you're like, hey, I'm going to go... Uh, I'm starting to warm up for a training session. The body is starting to prepare itself. It's mobilizing resources. All those resources are the same. It's like this fuel for adaptation. And uh, I, I want to interject one thing here. This is something that people don't think about too often. Is stress is really perceived as one input. Like the, the body and brain don't know physical versus psychological. As Chris is saying, you're switching on the same systems. And I think we'll talk about a little bit later about building this capacity. The great thing, because this response system is generic, there are things that you can do to build this tank. Does that make sense? So like people are like, well, my, you know, physical versus psychological, it's just HPA axis, autonomic nervous system adjustments and immune system changes. So it's really like you're just flipping on the same switches. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So from the moment you wake up, Let's just assume that you got a great night of sleep and we'll talk about the importance of sleep here in a minute. Let's just say your sleep was perfect. You're going to wake up with a full gas tank. We'll just hypothetically say that. You wake up, let's just say you have a 6 a.m. workout session. Well, depending on, let's say it's high intensity, that's going to deplete your gas tank, we'll say 25%. You get to work and your boss starts yelling at you about a project that's late and you start ruminating on that. Well, that's like that entire process of you stressing about it over x period of time it could be an hour it could be two hours three hours whatever it is that's pulling gas from your tank you get to the end of your work day and you go home you might have 10 percent of your tank left and then now you got your kids and your kids you know can sometimes i have a three-year-old and a you know a one-year-old and that can be a stress and what i find is on the days that i overstretch myself by the time i get home when it matters the most for my family like you know your willpower shot like your stress tolerance is shot your body is basically just going into survive mode and then you start reacting negatively like you know your kids and you start like it it catches yeah, or eating a bunch of junk food so you can kind of build up yes. that, that, the reserve yeah. <laughs> you, you start having coping mechanisms they're like all right let's try to get through this and a lot of people's coping mechanisms aren't the healthiest coping mechanisms so you can kind of see this cycle of you know, negative outcomes, especially when for the things that matter most. And so the whole concept is like, well, what areas in your life are draining your gas tank? And then what areas in your life can you, or what interventions can you be doing to increasing the size of your tank? So the global approach is to have a very large tank, physically fit, mentally resilient, all our ducks in a row so that we have fuel in our tank for the things that really matter the most in our lives so many questions that are going to stem off of that so you guys i, I want to i want to back up into this for a second so you guys have both trained coached and worked with athletes at the highest level and these are people that are trying to get the the most out of every single day um what, what are the typical things you guys are working you're working on with athletes at the greatest uh consistency or the most frequently we'll say as far as increasing their adaptive adaptive reserve? Yeah, I would say there's five pillars. Hmm. Sleep, exercise, mental fitness, nutrition, and relationships and community. Those five things, no matter who you are, the scientific literature is very clear. They do, if you engage in specific thresholds, you hit certain thresholds in these various activities 
or these various subdomains. Not only does it improve your ability to adapt to more stress, it increases longevity. And these are the things that are going to build a bigger tank. And so no matter who you are, if you're not doing these things to a certain degree, you're going to suffer. And Mm -hmm. so we could kind of knock some of these off, but the elite of the elite, as Chris was saying, so I've worked with like professional sprinters, you know, Olympic gold medalists or NFL football players, or they all kind of have the same biological signatures. Uh, They respond and adapt super fast. Now we may not all be able to have that quick reverse and that Delta, but we can all increase our adaptive capacity. The literature is very clear on that. And it just depends on how fast with where you're starting from. And so if you want to, we can talk about some of these different Sure. Yeah. And so one thing I'd like to yeah. touch along those lines is like, well, me getting into like how much, right? Like, yeah, how far should I push this system? As far as like, what does the science show as far as the fastest, most effective way to adapt? You know, if if I'm trying to push a specific system, if you could touch on that a little bit in this in this journey. Yeah. So I'm going to start with one of the things I'm most biased towards, and that's sleep, because that was my work. My research was on how sleep impacts our brain's ability to adapt to stress sleep is like the the fundamental tenet behind pretty much all adaptive responses that occur it helps with multiple things i'm sure we've all heard restoration of our immune system so chris was talking about when you're awake those stress systems are turning on right and what happens is when those systems are turned on Uh, your body's mobilizing resources to adapt to the dominant threat or dominant need at the time. When your gas tank gets low, you can no longer respond appropriately. So like if you're trying to improve protein synthesis or increase muscle hypertrophy or speed or power strength, you're not going to have as much adaptive reserves to allocate. When you sleep at night, those systems are down-regulated. And a couple of really cool things happen. When those systems are down regulating, you get restful and fulfilling sleep. Cortisol's turned down. Cortisol is a great hormone, really important for being alert and focused during the day. But at nighttime, if that's chronic elevated, your immune system is going to be compromised. You have long term adaptogenic memory that it t- actually takes place. There's this cool little relationship between slow wave sleep and your body's ability to create immunological memory for foreign invaders. So when this happens, your your immune system actually like creates this memory of like, oh, this is a bad foreign invader. I can address it faster in the future. From an endocrine perspective, we know that during slow wave or deep sleep, growth hormone is released, which is critical for tissue regeneration. More of that happens. So sleep is like in 90 to 120 minute cycles. And early in sleep, you have a pressure for slow wave or deep sleep. And so you're going to see more of these pul- this big pulse and growth hormone. Later on at night, you have more REM sleep, and that is for, for men, critical for testosterone release. And most of our testosterone is released during then. As a matter of fact, in older men, you can almost predict with high level of accuracy their testosterone level just by looking at sleep duration and fragmentation. And so if you're the first thing that's going to happen is your body is going to prioritize that growth hormone because it's trying to restore the tissues. Later on at night, some cognitive things happen. We'll talk about some motor learning things, but you may have a dramatic decrease in testosterone if you're not getting at least at least seven hours a night. There was a paper. So when we're in our 30s, we start decreasing testosterone by one to two percent per year. There was a paper that showed that just one week of chronic sleep uh, restriction to five hours a night led to like a 10 to 15 percent reduction in overall testosterone that's like aging a decade in one week as far as testosterone so um you mentioned eating earlier sleep also regulates leptin and ghrelin which are your hunger hormones and consistently sleeping less than seven hours a night leads to overeating up to about 400 calories a day sleep is really important for Things like protein synthesis, your body undergoes significant restoration during that time. Actually, there's a period during sleep where you have a blocking at the corticospinal pathways where you're basically in complete paralysis. And we believe this is so that you can have myofibular restoration because now like your body can't move so your muscle tissues can completely relax. 
a lot of uh, muscle protein synthesis is happening during that time. Also, if you, this happens during REM sleep, you know, you have crazy dreams. Like if you could actually act those things out, that could be pretty dangerous. So your body kind of shuts off that, uh, that capability. There's a lot of um, motor learning that happens during different parts of sleep. So memory consolidation, learning, the finalization of learning, neuroplasticity happens while you sleep. So from a restorative property, uh, restorative perspective, sleep is like one of the primary things that you need to get. So seven to nine hours is critical. Most people overestimate by half an hour. So if you think, you know, I'm going to bed at 11, getting up at six and you're getting seven, you are not. Actually, there was a paper that just uh, Apple and the American Heart Association are doing a study together right now. They're releasing the findings and it was, I believe, almost two million nights of sleep and all these people wearing Apple watches. The average person in the U.S. is sleeping six and a half hours a night. This is deleterious for adaptive processes. There was also another paper that just came out recently on central adiposity in sleep. And there was kind of this leveling off. Did you see this, Ben, where like, you know, you had less uh, central adiposity kind of leveling off at eight hours a night. And so I thought that was fascinating. But it's really critical for muscle hypertrophy, strength development, hormone regulation, protein synthesis, immune function. Like if you want to unhinge somebody, like, Take away sleep. That's why, like in a lot of these um, special operations communities, specifically the army, they'll sleep deprive you and take away food because now they can really see how you can respond under pressure and under stress. So, if you want to adapt and thrive, you definitely need to get enough sleep. I'll close by saying this: my research was looking. Uh, so, Omega Wave did two things. It looks at HRV and something called DC potential. And DC potential is a slow cortical potential in the brain. And it's basically, you actually get a millivolt potential. So it's almost like a battery. And there's some literature out there that shows like there's these certain ranges, millivolt ranges that are ideal for skill acquisition and learning and performance. And seven to nine hours slotted you right within those ideal times. And it lined up with exactly what the National Sleep Foundation said, you know, says. And so if you're listening to this, you're like, look, I'm great on six. I can almost guarantee you that you're not. You most likely don't have that genetic polymorphism that allows you to thrive. So, you know, sleep is the first one. Do you, is there any, you know, one, any feedback on that or questions? Yeah, yeah. That, that was amazing. So, I mean, the, I think it would be remiss to, to not dive into some of your favorite practices to improve sleep. So, the audience yeah. has heard, you know, the basic things. Uh, I'm curious if you have a protocol and if you have some sleep hygiene stuff. Is there anything that you're like, hey, this is this is a non-negotiable for you? Yeah. One of the first things that we learned, there's two things that drive sleep. There's this homeostatic drive, which means like when you wake up in the morning, you're not as sleepy, hopefully. As the day progresses, you get this hunger for sleep. That's That's the first one. The second one is this circadian drive. The circadian rhythm is literally means about 24 hours it's an endogenous rhythm and there are these things called zeit givers or time givers that really anchor your circadian clock light temperature food movement the most critical one is light we learned this like day one if you read any scientific literature on this so andrew huberman did not invent this it's in the literature i don't think you would take credit either but you need to go outside and get sunlight and here's why Light interacts with these cells in your eyes that sends a signal to this thing that sits above the roof of your mouth called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the circadian pacemaker. When you have enough intensity of light coming into the eyes, the circadian pacemaker then sends a signals to the every cell in your body that it's time to be alert. It does this through increasing cortisol and it also increases body temperature. So now you're more alert. During the day... As you get more sunlight exposure, actually, you know, Sachin Panda is, he's at the Salk Institute. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I just had him, I just had him on my podcast and something I learned that I did not know. 
I knew that the relationship between light and melatonin, but they're finding now that the more frequent exposure you get to sunlight during the day, it's increasing melatonin secretion from the pineal gland at night. So look, like it's one thing for me to be like, sleep more. You're like, gee, thanks. Great, Eric. That's, that's really helpful. It's another thing like, what do I do to create the conditions to where I want to fall asleep? So get up in the morning, get as much bright light. And then during the day, like I just... Every 90 minutes to two hours, I just go get a lap or two around the block. Also try to get in a little more steps, right? But if light is an alerting signal in the morning, it's also an alerting signal in the evening. So as the sun goes down, you need to dampen the lights in your house. Chris and I do Zoom calls sometimes at nights for AIM-7 and like I got all the lights down. It's like a cave in here because you're going to stay alert. And so it's not you know, the blue light on your cell phone is one thing. It's just light in general in your home. And so if you want your kids to fall asleep, if you want to fall asleep, just start turning things down. And then I would say the last big one is the cell phone can like just crush you. And and it's not so much the blue light as it is, there was a really cool study done on this recently where they were like looking at light versus it's really just the emotional arousal. Mm. So if you're in bed and you're like, ah, I just want to check one more time on this. And all of a sudden you were dead tired, but you saw a video or you read a thread on Twitter or a YouTube video, all of a sudden you're alert and awake and emotionally aroused. That crushes your ability to go to sleep. And so, you know, regulate your day with light at nighttime, try to avoid emotional stimulation. If you do this for several weeks or even a month and you're still having issues, you definitely want to go see a, um, a physician or somebody that, you know, can do a sleep study because, you know, sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea can, if you can get that cleared up, that could change your life. What do you suggest for for people or athletes who you know, they, they have a racing mind? A lot of people have a lot of stress going on. They're they're busy. They get you know they get to the end of their day and their brain is still fired up. Mm. Well, this comes down to the third thing. I think mental fitness, and I'll let Chris talk about this. But you know, we one of the things you know a lot of people talk about mental health, and I think that's great. Mental health is a really important thing for us to be discussing but adaptive capacity really comes down to your physical and mental fitness and so you know when you're mentally fit you're a bit able to adjust to and be mentally present to changing circumstances and you're able to act and engage in a way that's aligned with your values and that's really a mentally fit person. And that, that, that involves the conversation going on up here. I'm pointing to my head because I think we'd all agree the war is won from the chin up. The best of the best. I want to give one, one real quick antidote and I'll give it to Chris. Do you know who's run the most sub 10 second 100 meter sprints in the history of track and field? No, I don't. It's not Bolt. It's Asafa Powell. Hmm. But... Asafa Powell is technically one of the greatest sprinters ever. Like if you like you watch him sprint and you're like, oh my gosh, could never get it done under the big lights. You put him in bolt, he would just piss his pants. I would I wish I was as fast as him. He made a ton of money. He was a wonderful athlete, but he wasn't mentally resilient enough when when the pressure really came. And so like that's really what separates the elite. But it's there's your skills that anybody can develop to build out their gas tank so chris why don't you talk about this this is a particular area of passion for him yeah so back in 2013 or 2014 when i was writing my dissertation i told eric i was like you know the more that i dive into this i was like this is elite athletes at the time i was like the future of training is not from the neck down it's from the neck up i was like you know training training's training these are elite athletes they're going to respond to stimulus but you know, this is about the same time when social media was really starting to kind of like take off. I know it's really, you know, prevalent now, but like our athletes were starting to feel the pressure of social media from fans that were comparing themselves. And so I had a chance to work with one athlete who I didn't figure this out until he came in to test on Monday, Omega Wave, and 
he tested horrible and I was like, you know, what'd you do this week? And he's like, you know, on Friday night I went to dinner and I just had horrible service. Like the waiter was so slow and like he was just going on and on and on about his service. I was like, dude, you carried that not only from like from Friday, you carried that to Saturday to Sunday and on Monday you are still triggered by this experience that you had, which led me to kind of, you know, go down some rabbit holes and research. And that's when I found Headspace. Headspace had just kind of come onto the scene and Headspace was mindfulness meditation. And I got this athlete on uh, meditation three days a week. And we did it for about 12 weeks and he gained 18 pounds of lean mass in, in, in that short amount of time. And all we did was impose a mental fitness intervention and when you start looking at the mechanisms of meditation, it actually makes structural changes at the amygdala. The amygdala is basically what you know alerts the brain that there is a stress or a, a fear uh, activation. And we've seen through studies that this actually changes the threshold at which that gets activated. So all I did was basically, you know, raise that threshold for the athlete. So I started thinking to myself, well, if a ten minute mindfulness meditation can elicit that type of response, raise the threshold, we're basically just increasing our size of our mental gas tank by doing that, which is allowing us to have a better adaptive response in the gym. Mm -hmm. And so from that moment on, like I was sold on this mental fitness piece of we could be doing training exercises that is going to create structural changes in the brain at both the amygdala, the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex that makes us more resilient to just everyday stress and when you start to kind of look at it you know you dive into it athletes are more likely to get hurt two times of the year midterms and finals so when training load stays the same well you have a massive increase in academic stress while our athletes are getting overloaded it, it all ties back to this big gas tank example if we can't manage the stress outside the training facility it's going to rob us of our stress inside the training facility we're not going to be able to adapt to the workouts that we're doing. And so that was my first kind of taste of what just training the brain can do for the athlete. But when we look at general populations, you know, the more I talk to people, the more that I'm I'm trying to understand why, why is it that we yo-yo? Why is it that we can't maintain, you know, a consistent fitness routine? I know that you want to look good. Everybody wants to look good. Well, what's keeping you from doing that? And, you know, that has got all of us into this value-based exercise. You know, their values, society tells us to value fitness purely on an image instead of rooting it into their identity. And this was especially true for myself because, you know, when I was uh, doing the PhD, I was doing physique. When I was done with physique, I went into to, uh, powerlifting. When I was done in powerlifting, then I went into, uh, I ran a marathon. And I wanted to run a marathon and squat 600 pounds in the same, but it was just always this like achievement, like, but I never really felt satisfied with those achievements. It was always a what's next attitude. Well, what I realized is those goals were rooted into really nothing more than just achievement. And I didn't really truly value achievement. That was something my father valued a lot and kind of like was, you know, put on me as a child. And so I kind of carried that. It, it turned for me when I realized like I was training one day and uh, basically ripped my hamstrings. The side note to that is my AIM-7 score told me I should not be lifting that day, but I decided to go in and do an insane deadlift workout tore my hamstring and I couldn't pick up my daughter that night. And that's when it hit me. It's like, you know, you, you're training for the wrong reasons. And then it became, I want to train so I can be able to pick up my daughter, that I can play with my daughter, that I can play with her kids when I'm 85 years old. Like, I want to live as long as I can so I can help my daughter navigate through this life. And at that moment, training became easy, right? Like, get, getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get on the Peloton to increase cardiovascular fitness was easy, you know, because you root it back into something that truly matters. And the more people that I talk to nowadays, it's they really don't know their identity and they don't uh, they don't understand their values and if we can't start there then it, it's going to be a rough road in actually achieving the goals that we set out to do so you know this is why i'm, I'm really big on one establishing your why rooting it into your value and then reminding yourself of your values frequently to revisit when you have a fitness goal on top of that while training those brain components, uh, the mindfulness meditation, 
gratitude journaling, um, the relationship piece. And, you know, the Harvard, the 75 year study on happiness from Harvard, you know, what's the number one predictor? Quality relationships. Really keying in on it because if you know what it feels like to be happy, when you're happy, just everything just feels good. Your training session, you hit PR is like, if you can just become happy, then everything seems to kind of fall in place. But life happens and stress happens. And this is why we have to be mentally resilient enough to be able to handle those things. Love it, man. You're talking about my language. You had Dr. John D. Martini on. I'm not sure if you know him. He's he's the values guy. Like he's, he's a legend in that space. And helping people sift through their own consciousness, their own identity to identify the values, in my experience, hasn't always been the easiest thing. Do you have any, any particular uh, suggestions for anyone listening to really start to drive down on, on what their why is or what their values are? Yeah. And it was tough for me too. And I think it's tough for a lot of college athletes because their identity always has been, you're an athlete and they never really truly do that self-examination. And so for me, it was really about taking inventory. You have to be mindful of the things I call it your joy metric. You know, what are the things that make you feel fulfilled? And when you have that moment of fulfillment, acknowledge it. And then root it back to is like, well, why did I did I feel that? That's when you can start to because like when I went through like the, you know, those values exercises, and Eric and I go back and forth all of this time because we're trying to do this, you know, make sure our our people know their values is when I look at a list of values, my first inclination is like the first ones that I picked were ones that I don't think were my values, but I think that were maybe my I thought my dad might want me to be like, or like, oh, I like that value, but it never like, really yeah. truly aligned with myself. And so the first time I did the values exercise, it was good, but it's it's always doing like a, a values check. It's like, all right, do these things actually bring me joy and fulfillment? And then if it's not, then it's all right, let's check that one off and reevaluate. And it, it's taken me probably... I mean, honestly, three to four months to really hone in on my my top three. It's not as simple as just writing them down, but you, you kind of have to start there, right? Just with anything else. Just start with like a list of 10, work your way down to five, and then just be kind of present in those moments of things when you you feel it. It's that tingly kind of like joy feeling you get. You'll know it when you feel it. It's just being present and acknowledging. And then for me, it was just my kids. Uh, it was my daughter. That was like the, you know, one of the number one things. And then what I want my kids to grow up. And that's just a, a growth mindset. Like growth is my number one value. It's, you know, not being afraid to make mistakes and learning from them. And so, and then fun. And then, um, like I said, it's, I, I just think we're, we're put on this earth to have a good time. You know, we're supposed to enjoy it. So fun. I want to try to have fun in a lot of things I do, but yeah, it's, values is it's it's not easy but it, it's it's very worthwhile from a, a longevity standpoint if you really know yourself and know your values yeah i love it chris dr d martini suggests doing his value factor multiple times and then he says well which ones actually show proof of coming true because there's the values that i want to embody that i'm like oh, you know i really want to value wealth but does that actually show proof of coming true? Because some people like everyone, everyone, if you ask everyone, you know, under the age of 25, they all want to be multimillionaires, but they're like, well, are you actually doing anything in pursuit of that? Or is that just like you're, you're, you're maybe taking on one of society's values and saying, oh, this is really important because I need to keep up with everybody else. But in reality, you don't actually give, you know, care about that. You just feel like you should. And so uh, great, great insights. Um, Eric, anything to add on that one? Or do you want to move on to the third pillar? I would just say that, you know, there's there's some really interesting research now, and I think we're going to start seeing more of this coming out of the pandemic on the, you know, some of these mental fitness interventions, you know, mindfulness, I would say. There's a great story I like to tell. One of our advisors is Dr. Peter Haberl. He's a former senior psychologist for the U.S. Olympics, and he tells this beautiful story. He said, there's this fallacy that the most elite athletes don't feel pressure. It's total baloney. You know, there was a guy named Dr. or Sir Chris Hoy. He's the greatest Olympic cyclist of all time. He won six Olympic gold medals. And when they asked him what it felt like to race in an Olympic finals, he said it felt like he was going to the gallows. He was going to be executed. That's a pretty heavy feeling. Mm -hmm. If the outcome of a future event is uncertain or important, you should expect to feel uncomfortable. 
If the outcome of a future event is uncertain and important, you should expect to feel uncomfortable. What everybody want with elite performers, whether that's performance at work, performance with your family, performance in the gym, whatever it is, what you want is control of your attention because attention is the currency of performance. The way that you can train this, one of the ways is mindfulness. Mindfulness is not this religious experience. It's harnessing and and training attention. Where is my mind so that I can focus it on what's important? Because what Sir Chris Hoy went on to say is, is that he would feel this way, but then he would shift his attention to his hands on the steering wheel or his feet in the clips or his butt in the seat. He would actually direct it towards an action. When we get anxious and overwhelmed, it's because we ruminate instead of being able to go, now I'm going to take an action anchored in who I am and what I value. And so these these tools, if you know how to use the tools, can dramatically improve your mental fitness and I would tie this into a third pillar here, which is community. The re- The research is becoming very clear that if you do not foster healthy relationships, you know, you're going to be in trouble. There was an interesting paper that was published in the British Psychological Society that came out post-pandemic, which showed that people that had greater social connectedness during the pandemic periods experienced less worry, fatigued. They had low, lower perceived levels of stress. Basically, it created a buffer to poor mental and physical health outcomes. There was also a paper I started studying. So there's this concept. Have you ever heard of allostasis or allostatic load? Yeah. So refresh your allostasis is the body's brain just trying to achieve stability through change. Allostatic load is just basically the cost of adaptation, right? So I was doing some research on what are things that improve our ability to adapt to allostatic load. Interesting things popped up. One was there's a study with over 5,400 people over 18 years that found that regular attendance in a faith community, didn't talk about what kind of faith, just whatever, lowered allostatic load. There was a 55% reduction in all-cause mortality, wow. controlling for sociodemographics, clinical and laboratory factors. Now, whether or not you have a faith or not, what are the, what's the commonality of a faith community? People in person, connecting. Things in common, celebrating you. Yeah. And there was a paper that just came out of from the University of Kansas that demonstrates that just one meaningful conversation per day boosts mood, lowers stress, and enhances social connectedness. So like this, a meaningful conversation was like engaging in somebody with somebody and offering a sincere compliment or listening with intent in a conversation or showing care And they found that here's the kicker is that electronic forms such as DMs, text, whatever, social media was significantly less effective than face-to-face. And so we are designed, people need real life connection. Uh, If you don't have a family, strongly suggest trying to find at least one person that you can connect with. Maybe, maybe you know, you're not a really extroverted person. Maybe you're at work now you can find somebody maybe during coffee break or lunch to just have a real conversation. Does that have to like, you have to spill your guts, but just like, I want to ask somebody a question and then I want to listen for like, like with the intent of like understanding or caring that will dramatically improve your health. So that would be like the third pillar. And then there's nutrition and exercise um, we could talk for days about nutrition. I would just say that like globally speaking, there's a lot of different ways to eat for weight loss and I don't really want to go down that rabbit hole. I would just say that the research is pr- pretty clear that consuming an anti-inflammatory diet comprised of like unprocessed foods, rich multicolored vegetables, nuts, whole grains, healthy fats, you know, that kind of stuff reduces stress, impacts our ability to adapt to stress, s- lower systemic inflammation, you know, the the Mediterranean diet or kind of in that ballpark, the li- research is really good on like mental health. And so I'm not saying that you have to never enjoy anything that's processed, but generally speaking, consuming these types of foods sets your body up for a- adaptation. Um, there's a lot of interesting research coming out right now on ultra-processed foods. 
And because now we have actually have some, you know, a lengthy period of time where people have been eating this way and its impact on systemic inflammation and and potentially mortality. So that's a real that's a that's a serious factor to consider. You know what you're putting into your body. Chris, do you have any comments on that? On the nutritional piece? Yeah. I mean, I know that's a sensitive one for a lot of people. <laughs> like, don't mess with my food, you know? Well, and it, it's so individual because, you know, people have certain likes, dislikes, and you've got certain... And then the problem with nutrition is you've got so much disinformation out there. Mm. Uh, and that's just fitness in general. But like I said, the, the inflammation piece is, is really big. We just had an athlete that uh, went through combine training. He gained 30 pounds in eight weeks. He had a, and this is the first time that he had actually had a, a food allergy test and he, it was the worst one I'd ever seen. Everything lit up and all the foods that he was eating were just causing massive inflammation. So as soon as he figured out what the foods that he was consuming, causing the inflammation and eliminated them and improved his gut health and he started having a better adaptive or adaptive response. But, you know, I, I think for the most part, people honestly know what good food and bad food is like i shouldn't go out and eat fried foods every day i give it up and consume lots of alcohol i shouldn't go out and you know they everyone knows like everyone knows they need eight hours of sleep it it all comes down to changing behavior i think there's some confusion all around like grains and dairy and and now people are saying vegetables are bad for you and like if you eat too much meat you're gonna get heart disease and if you don't eat enough meat you're gonna your, your testicles are gonna shrivel up like so I mean, there's so there's so much sensationalism in the, in the dietary space, like you said, the disinformation. That it is nice to hear credible sources like yourself, and just be like, "Hey, this is real. This is not real." So when we talk about nutritional interventions that impact adaptive reserve, like what are we talking? Like what what has the the negative impacts, right? So you talk about an inflammatory diet. You know, obviously it's variable person to person in many instances. But are there any levers where you're like, "Hey, don't do this," or definitely try this? Like, like which ones impact, seem to impact your your adaptive uh, capacity more than the next? Again, that's kind of a broad question, but anything that comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, a couple things. Protein is definitely a considerable factor. If you're not getting enough protein, that, you know, sarcopenia, you could have a whole lot of deleterious things start to happen. What is optimal, you know, like they're one gram per pound of body weight. There's some flux in there. Multi, you know, we do know that for instance, for most people, Multicolored fruits and vegetables because of the phytochemicals and antioxidants and things like that are very beneficial. Healthy fats, healthy in quotes. I'm going to put that in quotes there. These things affect hormones. You know, your body needs some basic things. You start pulling these things out and that's why we have things like scurvy, right? If you don't get enough vitamin C. So I would just say like you, they're, the macronutrients are really important. Yes. Can you, can you thrive in a ketogenic environment? Yeah, is it optimal for all sorts of different things? That's up to debate and you can dig it. I don't want to do that here, but I would just say making sure that you're getting enough protein, that you're fueling with enough carbohydrate, you're giving yourself enough fuel for the activity that you're doing because you don't want to get in a situation where you don't have enough fuel and then you're in a compromised state. Chronic, like if you want to just crush your testosterone, chronically under eating, is a really bad thing to do. You want to, I mean, thyroid, hormone, all the stuff starts to come down. If you're doing a contest prep, you know that's part of it, right? If you if you really want to get super lean, unless you're, you know, using external resources, those things are going to continue to come down. But just knocking off the fundamentals, make sure you're hydrating enough. If anything's messing with sleep, like you're consuming too much caffeine or you're consuming alcohol in the evening, we know that Alcohol consumption significantly impacts gray and white matter volume now. There's some pretty good research on that. Yes, you fall asleep faster, but your sleep is fractured. It's not going to be as restful and fulfilling. These are all things though, like, no, like we're not asking you not to live life though, right? So it's like all of these things have to be like 80, 90% of the time you should be doing the things that are going to lend themselves to health and adaptation. And then- if you want to go have a ranch water with your friends, everyone, go for it. You know what I'm saying? That also can be like the the stress of not being human. <laughs> like most of our most engaged social experiences happen around what? Food. 
Think about the holidays. Feasting has gone on for centuries. So there are things where it's time and it's, it's appropriate to celebrate. But just your day in, day out should, you know, kind of check some basic boxes. Chris, do you have any comments on that one? I think the biggest thing with nutrition is just systems and structure. And, you know, this is coming from, you know, I've tried every single nutritional program out there, intermittent fasting I've done. I've done eat, stop, eat, intermittent fasting. I've done three-day fast. I've done core back loading. I've done, you know, caloric restriction. I mean, I've done them all and they're all effective. But the key to all of them was I was consistently getting in the protein on all those protocols were the same. Like the calories were the same. The, you know, the protein was the same. The carbs were the same. It was very consistent and very structured. And I think for most people, they lack consistency and structure. And if you can just be consistent in getting and just start with protein, let's just, I, I would say majority, especially males, bigger males have a hard time getting in the protein that they need to, because they're not aware of what they're putting in their body to begin with. And then when you start to kind of like, all right, now let's add in calories and let's add in carbs, let's add in fat, or you can go all hundred percent and do all of it one time. But I just think having a system and having a structure and doing whatever works for you. Intermittent fasting for me worked for a long time because of my schedule. I was super busy from five o'clock in the morning with football until about noon and it just happened to work for me. I didn't have to worry about food. Was it probably the most ideal? No, but it was the most ideal for me from a consistency standpoint and I had great success with it. But at the end of the day, it's like for me, my hierarchy of rules is get your protein in, eat less inflammatory foods and, you know, hit my calorie goals. It, that's just kind of where I'm at right now personally, because I'm not training for anything specific or competition. And I'm just, it's just life at this point. Beauty. Eric, you want to go to, I think we're on number five now, right? Yeah. Number exercise. Four. This is probably, yeah. there is just some basic stuff that people need to hit. Most people probably listen to this or clearing these hurdles. Research is pretty clear. Like, you know, 150 to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic activity a week. There's some pretty cool research. You pair that with one to two. This is like people here are going to be resistance training more often, but you pair that with one to two resistance training sessions a week. That's a 40 to 47% decrease in all cause mortality. Mm -hmm. We know, but, but most Americans, most people around the globe are not getting close to this. The three buckets are activity, are you moving enough, general movement, aerobic exercise, and then resistance training. You know, the 10,000 steps thing, the funny thing is it was a, it's a lie. It's like this uh, marketing campaign for a Japanese pedometer created in the 60s. But ironically, the scientific literature is starting to show that like 7,000 steps a day is kind of the minimal threshold that you need to hit. For, for things like cardiovascular disease, mortality, more is better. The benefits start leveling off around 10K, but knock yourself out and walk more. If you have a hard time sleeping, try to get more steps in. That, that also you know adds more pressure to the sleep equation. Aerobic exercise, we know that you know there's so many amazing things for cardiovascular health, impacting the architecture, the actual morphology of your heart. Uh, to things like BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which helps with neuroplasticity. Now we're finding that there's some pretty cool stuff going on with resistance training and something called irisin, which then kind of amplifies the effects of BDNF. You don't really need to know all the science behind it. You just need to be performing aerobic exercise at least 150 to 300 minutes a week. You need to be resistance training. This improves the structural and global resilience of the body, and you've got to move enough. I mean, it's it's pretty simplistic, but in the knowledge worker economy that we are in now, it has become more and more difficult to hit these benchmarks because 100, 150 years ago, we were in an agrarian society. People were not getting everywhere with vehicles and stuff. We were just more active. We were outside. That's how people you know, made their livings. Now we're inside, we're making our livings with our brains, chat GPT. Now there's like prompt engineers making 300,000 a year, you know, so life is just different. And so you have to be more cognizant of making sure that you were doing these things. With AIM-7, we have noticed most people that come in 
are doing better than normal on that this end of the spectrum. It's these other areas where they're lagging and it's impacting their ability to improve the thing that they want to see the outcomes in. They're not getting the physical results. They're not able to lose weight because they're not getting sleep and their adaptive reserves are just drained. They're not able to increase muscle hypertrophy or strength because their adaptive reserves are drained because of relationships or the mental fitness component. And so if you blend these things in concert, you know, I will just say this, the greatest incubator for all of this I found was in combine training. Chris can agree. Like the first time I ever trained a group of people for the combine, I was at Mississippi State in 2008. I had an athlete named Lance Long. He had caught nine balls his senior year. And there's a, I have a picture of him. And this is like one of these like crazy before and afters, right? Just kind of, it's the end of the season. Body's a little emaciated. It just kind of happens a little bit sometimes. After like, I think it was 12 or 16 weeks of training, he ate perfect. He slept right. Stress from school kind of went down because his senior year has less stuff. His body completely like metamorphosized. And it wasn't just him. It was like four other guys, including him. He ended up getting a three-year career in the NFL, ran like a 4.38 at his combine, vertical for almost, I think it was 40 inches, and broad jumped almost 11 feet. And it, I was like, holy crap. Like, and, But it happened with four other guys. And the, I remember the head football coach comes over. He's like, what in the world happened to him? You know, and I was like, well, and in these combine scenarios, you see these people go away to Exos or whatever facility. And as long as the training is remotely in the right direction, you see these massive changes. And if you start thinking through this, what are they all doing at these places? They're training, right? They're getting enough sleep. The, a lot now they're engaging more mental fitness, but stress from other areas is taken down. Yeah, stress from football's upticked. They have a community that they're with. You know, so all these boxes are checked, and what happens? Kaboom. Now imagine if you could kind of take that to anybody in the world, and you can kind of democratize that now. You can see amazing changes. And you're always looking for their limiting factors. Mm. And, you know, from like just like in bodybuilding, right? Like you go to a competition, you get your judges' feedback and say, Hey, we need any more development in quads. It wasn't quite defined. Well, what do you do? You spend more time in quad development. You're trying to bring that feature out about you. It's the same thing in these pillars and domains. Like you and I are probably crushing the physical side of or meeting those guidelines. But for me, I knew that I was deficient. I wasn't investing enough time into my mental fitness and then also my sleep. And so those two areas is like, all right, well, if I can put my training on autopilot, really be intentional about mental fitness and sleep, I'm going to have a better adaptive response. I'm going to be a more complete person, athlete, whatever it is. So like the beauty of like this AIM-7 approach is being able to look at people's data, their historical data and be like, listen, like you're not, you know, getting to where you want because you're only getting five hours of sleep. We're going to start there. Let's fix that. And then when we fix that, it's like, okay, you're, you're doing great on the physical side. And then we're going to push you towards, hey, let's start adding in some meditation and mindfulness and let's just see the effect of that. And it's just like trying to pull out those little weak patterns in your behavior. Where can I invest the most or the time and get the biggest return on my investment in quality of life and longevity? So like I said, for a lot of people, I, I'm finding it's in, in our population, they're doing pretty good in physical, but they had, they're investing no time in their mental space and then they're robbing themselves asleep. So. All right. So, gentlemen, one of the things I'm most fascinated about that you guys are doing is, you know, working with athletes, the tip of the spear, there's a lot of, there's a lot of measurements being thrown around. There's a lot of metrics. I'm really curious, um, you know, you know, as a director of performance, wherever you guys work, what are the types of things that you guys are measuring at the highest level to really get that last 1% of the athletes? Yeah. So what I've done um, here is try to gamify our training process. And so the measurements that we pick are dumbed down to things like for our basketball team, like it's a NBA 2K profile, right? And all we'll measure things that on our force plates that measure power, that measure eccentric braking, that measure twitch, that measure these specific muscle characteristics that the strength coach will then use and say, okay, because you probably know guys that are 
strong but not fast or guys that are fast but not strong that's kind of like that velocity profiling and they can take that information and we can say all right well here we see that this is a weak pattern in your profile and then we can spend more time let's just say you're very strong but not very fast well we're going to spend more time on the velocity spectrum and your weight training to kind of increase power that way we do a lot with force plates but everything that we assess is a test that we actually know that's going to improve their total performance on the court or reduce their overall stress on the court. So for basketball, we push a lot more aerobic capacity. We're looking at VO2 max because we see that basketball players that have high VO2 maxes typically go throughout the season with less soft tissue injuries. Well, that makes a lot of sense because they don't expend as much gas in their tanks because they have a bigger gas tank to begin with. And that's what you're seeing with general populations too. And what I've seen with anybody that I've ever measured with Omega Wave, the higher the VO2, the less variability in day-to-day measurements they had. They tested green more often. It's because they have bigger gas tanks. And so it it comes down sport by sport, what we actually measure. Football, we're going to rely less on aerobic capacity, even though we're starting to see, you know, that being a lot more important, but more on that power speed spectrum body composition, and then also those technical tactical things. So, you know, here our arsenal, we use force plates. We use um, a system that measures hamstring strength. We have a DEXA machine here uh, that will do body comp. And we're always giving feedback to the athlete to show them where they're at, what the NFL standard is, because that's where they want to be, right? Here's where you're at. And the decisions that you're making today are either putting you towards that quadrant or putting you away from that quadrant. And so that feedback is is really important for the athlete to see because I can't control what you do outside this facility. I can only give you the information to show you're either improving or you're not. There's two big buckets that you probably want to look at. There's subjective and objective measures. So like objective are the things that Chris is describing, but there's also subjective, like your perception of your wellness is really important. As a matter of fact, there's some really good papers on this. Like I, when I was with one NFL team, uh, we, I wanted to understand the impact of travel across multiple time zones. So we would take salivary cortisol, salivary testosterone, SIG A, all this stuff. And we'd freeze it and send it off to this lab and all this kind of stuff. That's pretty laborious, right? Then we started finding out, you know what? If you just ask people and you apply the right math, it's pretty much related to biologically how they're responding to stress. So if they said that they were significantly more stressed than they do on their average, and you can make be very sensitive about the the way that you look at that, then cortisol would be elevated. Or if they said they were you know significantly more sore than normal, then creatine kinase would be elevated. One of the things that Chris and I started doing is combining subjective and objective to create algorithms. Because if you look at like the consumer population, one of the biggest frustrations with like, um, although these devices, you know, like Aura Ring or Whoop or whatever, is that this objective measure is telling you how your readiness is this. And you're like, crap, it says I'm a 30 and I feel like I'm an 85 today or 90. Or it says you're 95 and you're like, I feel like dog crap. And what we found is that your perception is actually can be a more sensitive metric. It's actually... Sometimes the objective stuff is lagging. And so if you know what that is on the day, then you can use that prescriptively. So in Chris's fluid periodization and stuff that we were doing with the athletes, I mean, it was pretty amazing. We used DC potential and HRV to kind of do intent. Anyways, it was pretty wild, but the guys had that were using a fluid model had 150 to 500% more improvement over their counterparts. They were doing the same program right next to them. And so it, you can collect all the data you want. You know, when I first started doing athlete tracking at Florida State in 2011, nobody had ever done that before. Nobody had ever quantified the game of football. We were the first people to ever do it. And we had a ton of data and it actually caused some friction at the beginning because we didn't know how to use it. And as you can imagine, as a decision maker, the head coach wasn't pretty too excited about that. And guess what? He had the right to not be excited about that. It wasn't until we turned that into actionable recommendations that actually changed performance the next season when we actually could use the data, we had an 88% reduction in injury and our team went on to win a championship. And so 
you can going back to the consumer population people have all these devices it's really not giving them anything that's truly actionable it's like oh we're going to give you insights well great like in sports the coach would basically like take that piece of paper with the insight and go put it in the shredder and and you know research now is actually demonstrating these wearable devices do not change long-term behavior they're ma- they're missing all the things that create a behavioral loop that actually change long-term behavior. That's uh, that's I know we weren't really talking about that but yeah, it's perfect. And that's so, so impacting me, go ahead. Yeah, so tell me about how you guys have integrated that into AIM7 because that sounds like where that where we're leading with that which is really interesting to me. So you're taking both the objective and the subjective uh, feedback. Yeah, so you know there's 125 million Americans right now that own a wearable and it goes back to what we talked about. People just want to change their behavior. They want to sleep better. They want to exercise more. They want to manage their stress. They want to improve their fitness. These devices are failing. So what we've done is, is we've taken subjective and objective measures. So on an acute day-to-day basis, we provide people with specific recommendations for what we call mind, body, and recovery. So Chris's fluid periodization is in there for exercise. So we'll tell you the precise type, intensity, and duration of exercise that your body is ready to adapt to today based off of your preferences, which is very unique. So let's say, I'm just going to throw something out there. Somebody wants to hop on their elliptical. We would say go this long and this specific heart rate. For mind, we can assess your psychological state. So let's say we see that your mood is down. We will send you a specific intervention for that thing right now. Same thing with sleep. And then what we do is after seven days, though, just like we would do with an elite athlete, like when an elite athlete comes to Chris, he takes them through a battery of tests. He doesn't just go write them a program. That is dumb. So what we do for the first seven days is we take them through all this values exploration and we create this habit building process while we're assessing their data. And then on day seven, we're like, hey, we bucket them into different levels, one, two, and three for mind, body, and recovery. And we're like, here's the area that you need to focus on. And then we create a small little goal and we link it all back to their values. And then we have this really cool learn section because what we found as coaches is that I can give you the perfect recommendation, but you got to have the knowledge to execute it. So we have some of the best in the world that are delivering, you know, quick information. It's like masterclass for health and wellness, but it's like 90 second to two minute videos. So we built this for busy people because we wanted to bring all this information that we we gathered with elite athletes and bring it to anybody with a wearable. So, like Ben, to wrap that up, it's you know imagine your clients and your system time under tension, right? Quality of tension, quality of movement, and you take someone that hasn't slept well, that has poor motivation, has poor energy. Do you think they're going to elicit the same response in the weight room? Are they going to have that quality mind muscle contraction, the ability to sustain the time under tension? and the proper mechanics to achieve the, the best response? Or would you take them and say, okay, if that's not going to be optimal, do you have one of two options? We can either change. So the fluid periodization model would be like, all right, I've got X amount of sets programmed. If you can give me one quality working set, I'm going to stimulate, not annihilate, right? Because there's no sense of adding stress to a stress system because you're going to have a maladaptation. Or we just change our focus and we're going to do maybe some zone two cardio, get some recovery going and we live to train another day. You know, over time that adds up to a much better adaptive response because it, there's, it's a waste of time. Your return on your investment to come in when your readiness is down and to do a quality workout, it's just not going to be there. So, you know, that's, that's just, um, it's a motivation thing. It's a, it's a mental thing. And, we find that people appreciate the opportunity to downshift and feel better and get to the next day and have a better gym training session. So the M7 is is a software that integrates with all other wearables right now? Yeah, so we're uh, it's an app and um, we're end-to-end integrated with the Apple Watch. Here in May, we'll have Whoop, Aura, and Garmin integrated into it. We're in private beta, which means you can't get us on the on the app store. So people sign up on the website, uh, we have like 2,500 people on the waiting list, but if somebody wants to join, if they put that they heard us on this show, we'll move them right to the top. And what we do is, is we do these monthly cohorts or actually bi-monthly cohorts. So they come in, we bring them in, let's say a hundred at a time or whatever, and they'll do a Zoom call or four Zoom sessions with me, Chris, and our team 
over that first month to teach them about adaptive capacity. It's been amazing. Like the the results that we're getting, the stories we're getting back of people like breaking through weight loss plateaus, people that are like, you know, in one month, my resting heart rate dropped 10 beats a minute. And I'm, it's just crazy what happens when you start making that tank bigger. And so we're trying to build a technology like we want to make all this data more actionable. We don't replace your personal trainer. We augment it. Does that make sense? So you can, you can have all the different, you can have your specific training regimen. We're just going to, we're going to layer underneath it and make it more effective. Beautiful. That's great. And this is all the stuff that I'm talking about with all my training clients and, and all of our coaches. And, you know, you can't give somebody a stress they can't adapt to. So guys, thank you so much for sharing. This is incredibly valuable. You did such a good job of packaging it into this this neat framework uh, that I'm sure everyone will absolutely love. And thank you, Frame 7. I look forward to trying it. I've got a, I've got, I'm, I've got all the wearables, so I'll, I'll jump in there and put my name on the list for the, when you guys open the next cohort. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate you guys. Thank you very much for being here, and hopefully we'll have you back soon. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben. I appreciate you. This is this is a blast. Thanks for listening to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. For full episode guides with important takeaways and bonus resources, head over to muscleintelligence.com slash learn. If you enjoy the show and find value in the content, please subscribe, share this podcast with at least one person you know and love who would benefit from this content, leave us a review, and support our sponsors. You can see the full list of show sponsors, discounts, and get exclusive Muscle Intelligence deals at muscleintelligence.com slash resources. To join our private community and get VIP access to my master classes, upcoming muscle camps, and other resources that we don't post anywhere else, head to muscleintelligence.com slash community. Most of all, thank you very much for your trust, for your time, and most importantly, for supporting health and fitness in this world. Enjoy your day. I look forward to seeing you here next week. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.